Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to this Rosalind Franklin lecture. Um, as you will know, um, this is a really outstanding um, evening in which we celebrate the success of women and also how they're going to use the funding from this award to further the careers of other women. This, I think, this year is going to be a great one. I'm really delighted to introduce Rachel McKendry. You'll see from the information that you were given, she's going to be talking about harnessing the power of mobile phones. And one of the first jobs I was asked to do was to make sure your mobile phones <laughs> were not harnessing any power. So could you please make sure they're turned off? And so the Rosalind Franklin Award is awarded annually um, to outstanding women scientists. So the idea behind the award is to choose somebody who has made a significant contribution to their research area and who also has a really smart idea about how they can further the careers of other women. And Rachel really embodied both of those aspects. I was privileged to chair the committee, um, the panel that selected Rachel, and she really stood out as somebody who not only had made significant contributions, but had a really smart idea, which I know she's going to tell you about in her lecture this evening. So the award is uh, very generously supported by the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, to whom we're very grateful because this, as I say, is really a, a very hallmark um, lecture for women. And so Rachel, as you probably will have read, is the professor of bio nanotechnology at the University College in London. Um, she was a former colleague in Cambridge and we've sort of missed each other, but we keep ending up in the same departments and often at the same meetings. So I've known Rachel for some time and I've known of her work for even longer. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce her tonight. I know you're going to enjoy this lecture. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, Rachel McKendry. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Carol. It's a great honour to be here this evening and to have this opportunity to tell you about our research into harnessing the power of nanotechnology, mobile phones and big data for global health. But I'd like to say up front that any credit for this research must be shared with my fantastic research team, my many collaborators and my family. And I'd like to thank so many of you for making the journey here uh, to celebrate with me this evening. Now, Rosalind Franklin is most well known for her work on DNA, but that's only, actually only part of the story, for she also made a vital contribution to our understanding of viruses. Applying many of the methods that she had pioneered on DNA to viruses, she was able to produce some of the finest diffraction patterns of viruses, revealing their structure with unprecedented clarity. And many believe that she deserved a Nobel Prize for her work on viruses in its own right. And interestingly, you can see here that on her headstone in 1958, it was her work on viruses that was inscribed and not her work on DNA as her lasting benefit to mankind. Born in 1920, Rosalind Franklin entered the world during the Spanish flu pandemic where tiny influenza viruses contained in droplets swept around the world at quite an astonishing speed. And this was an unusual flu pandemic in the scale of the death and that it targeted young, previously healthy adults. It infected an estimated a fifth of the world's population and between 20 to 15 million deaths were reported worldwide. Just pause for a moment and think, there were more deaths due to influenza than there were in the Great War, the First World War. The Times newspaper reported, it came and went a hurricane across the green fields of life, sweeping away our youths in hundreds and thousands and leaving behind it a toll of sickness and infirmity which will not be reckoned in this generation. Many likened it to the Black Death, the plagues of the Middle Ages. 
Now, over the last century, we've seen tremendous breakthroughs in medical research, which have brought us antibiotics, advanced diagnostics in the laboratory that you can see here, and vaccinations, which have collectively saved millions of lives, helping patients and protecting populations from the spread of infectious diseases. But the threat of infectious diseases hasn't gone away. And here you can see that at the top of our government's risk register, pandemic influenza sits, alongside threats like global warming and terrorism. And because new viruses can emerge from animal reservoirs, like birds or pigs, it is a naturally occurring phenomena. And Liam Donaldson said in 2005, we can't make this pandemic go away because it's a natural phenomena. It will come. But what we can do is to limit its impact. However, containing a contagious disease in our increasingly interconnected world is a challenge that shouldn't be underestimated. We just have to look at the global scale of the HIV pandemic, which spread under the radar of global healthcare systems and now infects 35 million men, women and children. And more recently, the Ebola outbreak in some of the poorest countries in West Africa um, shows that the threat of infectious diseases is, an ever, is ever present. And those outbreaks occur in countries that lack the resources for those advanced diagnostic laboratories that I showed in the previous slide. These are some of the poorest countries where there's actually only a few doctors. So it's clear that we need to bring new technologies to pick up those outbreaks in resource-limited settings and diagnose infections. But what is more, in doctors' surgeries, um, up and down the country here in the UK, doctors are finding it increasingly difficult to treat bacterial infections that they once could treat. And that's due to the rise in antimicrobial resistance. And here you can see the problem is that the drug pipeline has dried to a trickle. Dame Sally Davis, Chief Medical Officer, stated last year, we haven't as a society globally incentivised making antibiotics. It's a ticking time bomb. If we don't take action, then we may all be back in an almost 19th century environment where infections kill us as a result of routine operations. We won't be able to do a lot of our cancer treatments or organ transplants. So you can see there's a dramatic, a crucial need for new technologies to advance the search for new antibiotics and to better detect and diagnose infections in resource-limited settings. So you may well be wondering, what do mobile phones and big data have to offer? Well, the digital revolution is here. It's a reality. This year, the number of mobile phones exceeds the number of people on the planet, 7 billion. If every one of us turned our phones on, it would almost be a map of the human race. And many people don't leave home without theirs. We can see that actually two thirds of these people are in developing countries. There are three billion internet users and 80% of people in the UK search online for information about health. And it's potentially one of the first things you do when you or one of your loved ones becomes ill. We've seen an astonishing rise in, the, in social media, 500 million tweets per day, and 80% of those on mobiles. And 75 billion apps have been downloaded to date from the Apple App Store. And we're also seeing a rise in wearable sensors and the Internet of Things. So the digital revolution is very much here. Can you remember your first mobile phone? Um, well, it turned 40 last year. And they've changed a lot since the first mobile phone call was made in public in 1973, in the year I was born. And um, last year, the uh, web also turned 25. But this technology has changed a lot since those early days. And today our smartphones are crammed packed with tiny sensors. Here's just a selection of them. You've got a camera, a GPS to track our location, mechanical devices, uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes track movement, orientation um, of, our, of our phones. Proximity and light sensors adjust the display according to the environment that we're looking at uh, our phones in. And there are a range of communication and capacitive touchscreen sensors that we now just take for granted. So what's driven this revolution? Well, it's the march of Moore's law, which today delivers us a technology with feature sizes of 20 nanometers. And just pause for a thought, that's smaller than a single HIV virus or a bacteria, and only just a bit larger than a single antibiotic. So here, 
in the palm of our hand, we have quite an extraordinary technology which allows us to probe infectious diseases in a way that we never dreamed possible before. This evening, I'm going to tell you about three examples about how we can harness the power of this revolution um, to understand the mechanism of action of some of the most powerful antibiotics against MRSA, to develop smartphone-connected tests to diagnose HIV in resource-limited settings, and to build the foundations of an early warning sensing system to pick up diseases using symptoms that people report on the web. Now, my interest in antibiotics began um, as a graduate student in Cambridge, um, as Carol mentioned, um, and one of my first grants was actually from the Royal Society. It was a fellowship which allowed me to pursue my interest in antibiotics. And here you can see how it all began. So Alexander Fleming, when he won the Nobel Prize for the development of penicillin, sounded a word of caution. Um, it is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them. And the same thing has happened occasionally in the body. But what surprised many is just how fast resistance can emerge. And this table charts the arms race between man and the microbe. Here you can see it just took three years between the deployment of penicillin and when resistance was observed. We can see just, it took just one year for methicillin-resistant bacteria to emerge. But one antibiotic that appears to have stood the test of time is vancomycin. And you can see here that it took more than 30 years for resistance to emerge. And even today, it's one of the last treatments that we have for MRSA. So I became interested in why that should be. And if we could learn something about the way vancomycin works, could we develop better drugs? And what vancomycin does is something quite clever. It targets this outer cell wall of bacteria, which is a cross-linked peptidoglycan meshwork. I like to think of it as a bacteria's armour, and it's not present in human cells, but it protects it from the outside environment and uh, withstands the high pressures inside the bacterial cell. And you can tell I'm a chemist because I think it's an incredibly beautiful interaction. Vancomycin forms with the cell wall peptides uh, found in the bacterial cell wall. And it allows the formation of these five hydrogen bonds. It was actually Dudley Williams in Cambridge that elucidated this beautiful mechanism of action. And he likened it to the way a baseball uh, sits in the palm of a baseball glove. But while much was known about the chemical nature of the interaction, surprisingly little was known about the mechanical consequences of drug binding, which leads to cell death. And so I set out to investigate that um, and also look at the, um, the effect of drug resistance, which occurs by a deceptively simple mutation of this NH group to an oxygen, which deletes a single hydrogen bond from the binding pocket but renders the drug therapeutically useless. So working with Joseph Nadira, who's here today, and Gabriel Epley and Moyu Watari, we set out to investigate these on these tiny cantilever sensor arrays. It was technology that I brought back from IBM's uh, Zurich Research Laboratory, where I had the honor to work with Christoph Gerber, who's also here tonight. So what you can see here is an image of these tiny cantilever diving boards um, they measure less than the width of a human hair. And we coat one surface, the top surface, with a biomimetic carpet of molecules which mimics the peptides found in the outer cell wall of bacteria. And I've colour-coded the drug-susceptible form from the resistant form with that single mutation. If we then inject an antibiotic in solution, when it binds to the cantilever, it generates what's called a surface stress. And we can measure that optically by simply measuring the bending at the free end of the cantilever. And it bends a couple of nanometers, as you'll see. Um, and using arrays of eight diving boards, we can study up to eight reactions at once and look at reference coatings. And these are some of the results. You can see that as we changed the concentration of vancomycin, the signal increased, and we're able to detect binding in buffer and in whole human serum and discriminate between binding to the drug-resistant and drug-susceptible phenotypes at clinically relevant levels. Um, one of the big breakthroughs was putting forward this idea that the um, nanomechanics of antibiotics depended on two factors. 
a chemical factor which describes the local drug target interaction and a geometrical factor um, which recognises the spatial connectivity of binding sites. So if the drug binds at sites that are unconnected, there's no mechanical stress. But as soon as the sites begin to join up, you start to see stress network formation. And applying this idea to bacteria, um, we believe that vancomycin creates these point defects by inhibiting the cross-linking of the cell wall and slowly mechanically weakens it. But we became interested in other antibiotics that could potentially team up into molecular pairs and create a San Andreas fault across the bacteria. And I'm really pleased to say that we, uh, working with Targanta Therapeutics, we were able to elucidate the mechanism of a new antibiotic um, against um, vancomycin-resistant enterococci. But it was quite an interesting scientific story because structurally it's identical to vancomycin except for these groups which I've colour-coded. And their position is on the knuckles of the baseball glove. So it doesn't change the binding site. But what we found is it dramatically changed its ability to bind to drug-resistant peptides on a surface. In fact, it was four orders of, more, four orders of magnitude more active than vancomycin. And so this led to a, a new theory to understand the, the um, mechanism of action of antibiotics on surfaces, and we hope in its own way has helped to contribute to the development of a new antibiotic. Now, in a change of uh, focus, we're going to move on to the second area, so leaving the cantilever sensors and moving to mechanical devices that are found inside each one of your phones um, and exploiting them to diagnose HIV. This research is an exciting collaboration with a Newcastle-based company called OJ Bio, who are here tonight, um, with UCL partners who oversee the care of 15,000 HIV patients in London, with the University of Surrey, and it's all been funded by the National Institute for Health Research Invention for Innovation programme. And here's their acknowledgement and disclaimer. So we set out to build a mobile phone connected test to diagnose HIV in primary care and community settings. The test had to be simple to use, sensitive um, and specific with the ability to pick out biomarkers of HIV and then transmit the results to a phone and onto a healthcare system. And the research was motivated by the scale of the HIV pandemic. So there's no vaccine or cure, and diagnosis is the gateway to treatment and prevention. So if you look at the figures, there are 35 million people estimated to be living with HIV across the world. In the UK, there are 98,000, um, but more than 20,000 are completely unaware of their infection. Now, this is clearly problematic for th those individuals, since um, they are unaware of their infection, they can't get access to the antiretroviral therapy. Um, and this leads to increased risk of suffering and death. But it's also problematic for the wider public because people who are unaware of their infections are much more likely to pass it on to others. So early diagnosis clearly has health benefits to the patient. It also brings economic benefits because for every person we can prevent from contracting HIV, we save the NHS several hundred thousand pounds in treatment costs over, the lifetime, over their lifetime. But it's worth also pointing out that someone who gains antiretroviral um, therapy following an early diagnosis can lead a near normal life with near normal life expectancy. Um, and this, these um, human and economic drivers have led to major policy changes to widen access to testing in the UK in community settings, such as a GP surgery, but even money transfer shops have been tested. And um, here you can see three of the reports from the House of Lords Select Committee. The Health Protection Agency ran a pilot study showing that it was cost-effective, feasible and acceptable to test in different settings in a bid to normalise testing for HIV just as it was in my antenatal care. But very recently, we've seen um, quite a significant breakthrough where the Department of Health have announced plans to overturn the ban on self-testing for HIV um, in a bid to better protect the public and a recognition that we really need to pick up people who aren't aware of their infection. But the challenge is that as testing becomes more widespread, the concern is that 
um, we, uh, the tests that are used in primary care and community settings aren't sensitive enough. And we have to make sure that we're able to capture this data in order to ensure that diseases don't spread under the radar and we can get people into, uh, into treatment and care. Now, the very best tests that work well in tertiary hospitals work by detecting two key markers. In blue, you can see a viral protein called P24, and in green, the antibodies that are, uh, emerge in response to, uh, uh, from the patient in response to their infection. These are called fourth-generation antibody-antigen uh, tests. And as I say, they work extremely well in tertiary hospitals. They're very specific, sensitive, but they're typically costly, requiring large instrumentation and trained staff. Um, but they work very well in those settings. At the other end of the spectrum, the tests that work in primary care, as I said, are based on simple lateral flow type tests, so like a pregnancy test. But while they're very uh, simple to use and low, relatively low cost, they don't have the sensitivity and specificity that's typically desired. Commonly, they only measure the antibodies, this green line, and that can lead to missed opportunities to diagnose people in these early stages of infection. So what we set out to do with OJ Bio and the leading virologists and clinicians was to develop a point of care test that could diagnose HIV in primary care and community settings, but with the performance characteristics that we expect from um, advanced diagnostics in our laboratories. And the tests, uh, the, the sensors that we're working on, as I mentioned earlier, are found in each one of your mobile phones. They're called surface acoustic wave sensors, and they're typically used as high frequency bandpass filters. The tests work in quite an interesting way by creating a surface wave on, uh, on the sensor chip. And I'd like you to think about a duck pond. If you throw a pebble in, it creates a classic ripple pattern. Now, if a duck or a leaf sits on the pond, it changes that ripple pattern. And in the same way, with these sensor chips, we create a ripple pattern from left to right using special materials which change their properties when you apply an electrical current. And the sensing area in the middle is coated with a carpet of molecules that capture markers of the HIV infection, that capture that P24 blue curve antigen and antibodies in response to the infection. And when they sit on the sensor surface, just like the duck, they change the ripple pattern of the wave. And we measure that out electronically. Um, I've, just for illustrative purposes, I'm showing you an ex example here. It's not a HIV assay. But what you can see is that when we inject the sample, we can detect a readout within um, a minute up to five minutes, but it's a very fast assay and can work with complex media, whole blood, uh, nasal swabs, uh, saliva swabs for a range of different infections, um, and it's very simple to use. Working with Robin Weiss, um, who's a leading virologist, and again, I'm really pleased he's here tonight, we've been developing novel coatings to capture HIV uh, based on llama antibodies, which we can engineer um, to create small protein fragments that are a fraction of the size of conventional antibodies, but that have high affinity and are extremely temperature stable. These antibodies can almost be boiled, so we can certainly take them out of the fridge and use them in resource-limited settings where they may not be a cold chain supply. And they're also very manufacturable, and we're working with QVQ on these antibodies. And I'm pleased to say um, that Eleanor Gray is now beginning a pilot study um, in my labs um, using these, uh, this technology to evaluate HIV-infected patient samples. And that work is currently going to start later this month. OK, so the big question here, though, is where does the data go? Where do we send this information to? And that inspired me to um, lead a major EPSRC initiative to create the foundations of an early warning sensing system for infectious diseases. It's called iSense for short. And the idea came about that we really need to be harnessing this real-time geographically linked information that comes from a phone to track outbreaks of infections across the world. It, the vision is to create a system that links mobile diagnostics with symptoms reported on social media, with web searches, and with traditional public health laboratory test data. 
And the work has been funded, as I say, by the EPSRC. It's a major five-year collaboration and brings together a big team of people from UCL, Newcastle, Surrey, Imperial, Public Health England and the London School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And it's a fantastic interdisciplinary team. We're also working closely with our clinical partners and companies, so including OJ Bio, but also Microsoft, Cepheid, Cambridge Life Sciences, Telefonica and Melogic. And together we're working to build this system. So why is early detection important? Well, as I highlighted it earlier, early detection plays a crucial role in any outbreak situation. And for this we rely on, typically rely on accurate diagnostics. But there's often a time delay between someone being exposed to an infectious uh, virus and the time they arrive in a healthcare uh, setting, a, a GP surgery or accident and emergency, where samples then have to be sent off for confirmed diagnosis. And really, we want to be turning the clock back and picking up diseases potentially before even people even visit their doctor. Um, and so we're beginning to look at what are the symptoms that people self-report when they when, as soon as they become ill, when they tell their friends on Twitter that they're not feeling well, what information do they search for online, and can we even try and pick up people, um, infections before they have uh, become unwell, during this incubation period. And we know that's crucial in certain diseases, for example, like Ebola, where there's a 21-day incubation period. But from a public health perspective, the key questions are, what, what is the infectious agent? When and where did it start emerging? How much is out there? How is it spreading? Who is, infe who is it infecting? Are there certain age groups, for example, that are, certain, uh, are being more severely affected? And how severe is it? And this is important in a pandemic situation. Now, we're very fortunate here in the UK that we have a fantastic public health system. Public Health England run this integrated uh, surveillance system looking at outbreaks across the country, linking um, etiological reporting based on laboratory test data and samples sent off from GP surgeries, syndromic reporting, so looking at influenza-like illnesses, for example, reported to GPs at accident emergency, or when you call NHS Direct, now NHS 111. They're also closely integrated with the WHO and ECDC, uh, um, so the European Surveillance um, and CDC in America, uh, to integrate event reporting. And this information is all fed through data management systems, so that each week, for example, you have an influenza report um, published on their website. But it's also well recognised the, the number of cases seen by a GP and by Public King Health England is really the tip of the iceberg um, when it comes to the spread of diseases in our, in our communities. Um, so they re really only a fraction of people are hospitalised and, uh, and, and deaths recorded. And really the vast majority of people are unaffected and community cases not seen by general practitioners, but where people are infected, um, play a crucial role in the transmission of disease. And so we really want to be understanding what's going on at this level. Now, the question though is, can web data help to identify disease outbreaks? Well, um, I'm going to tell you about two examples uh, of work by others where it has made a significant contribution. So as early as 2003, an internet reporting system called ProMed, um, uh, which, which tracks emerging uh, diseases um, across inter uh, using internet reporting systems, uh, posted this report. This morning I received this email and then searched your archives and found nothing that pertained to it. Have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals there have been closed and people are dying. That outbreak, that was the first time the world heard about an outbreak that later became known as SARS. And it was several weeks before official reports emerged to say that the outbreak had occurred. So it's a classic example where individual people can be, uh, make a huge contribution to alerting global health systems that something unusual is going on in this part of the world. 
A second example is the use of Google Flu Trends. So Larry Brilliant and co-workers um, from Google.org, Google's philanthropic arm, uh, showed in 2009 that aggregated anonymous search queries of what people look for on the web um, could help to identify flu outbreaks two weeks earlier than traditional public health surveillance methods. And these are just two examples. Others include the Health Map um, um, initiative led by John Brownstein at Boston's Children's uh, Hospital and work on using crowdsourcing and Twitter. Um, but what's different about our research? Well, really, it's about delivering end-to-end -end solutions and integrating um, symptoms reported on the web with the mobile phone diagnostics because it's clear that many diseases can share common symptoms and the accurate diagnosis is crucial to ensure that we intervene with the right in the right way for example with antibiotics with vaccines and other public health programs and so through the IRC we're bringing together a large multidisciplinary team of researchers uh, to search for new markers uh, using genomic the advanced in genomics to search for new biomarkers of infection that don't require complex sample handling procedures, to combine advances in nanotechnology and microelectronics to build sensors that are extremely sensitive and able to pick up infections at a very early stage, combining telecommunications and big data to transmit, analyse, integrate different data sources and visualise and display it. But one of our crucial uh, strengths in the system is that we're working with leading clinical and public health experts to evaluate the uh, impact of our research in terms of the health and economic benefit, both here in the UK and in developing countries. So our work is focused on three different areas, flu, bacterial infections and HIV. But in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on flu uh, this evening. Um, and um, take you back to one of the earlier slides. So seasonal outbreaks of flu are uh, very common. In fact, in November, we're about to start this year's flu season. And the symptoms, the mild sort of symptoms that are typically reported are a fever, sore throat, muscle pains, and a severe headache. And these are caused by um, the tiny changes in flu um, antigens on the outer surface of the virus each year. And this is what requires us to get vaccinated each year. But pandemic strains are something quite different. They result in severe illness, death, and often uh, pneumonia complications are associated with the Spanish flu. There's also a time critical issue here. To, if you are to get antivirals to people, Tamiflu, for example, is only effective within 48 hours of symptoms onset. So it's really important that if someone's diagnosed that they can get access to treatment quickly and recognition that developing new vaccines can take months. Um, and as I said, the key questions from a public health perspective are, what is it, when and where did it start, how much is out there, who's it infecting, and how severe it is. Now, over the last year, we've built up a health dashboard to begin to um, track outbreaks um, across the UK. And this is the first time this has been presented in a, in a lecture, uh, a public lecture. Um, and it's work in progress, so don't take um, the results um, too seriously yet. But it's important to show that what we're doing here is harvesting 2 million tweets a day in the UK from 80 towns and cities up and down the country. Um, the tweets, uh, you've got some examples of things that are tweeted. This is publicly available. I haven't got time to have flu. Being ill is just inconvenient. Why are people allowed to work in an office while hacking and coughing all day? I don't want your germs. Some of you might be able to sympathise with this. But you can immediately see the challenge that um, some people have flu, others don't. And it's crucial that accurate models are developed <laughs> in order to accurately predict the outbreak of flu in these different regions across the UK. And I'd like to emphasise that this is the work that's led by Ingemar Cox's team and a fantastic postdoc, Bill Lampos and Jens Getty, who've developed this system. And it's also been a partnership with Microsoft, Public Health England and the Royal College of GPs. So this data, uh, uh, this um, 
dashboard system is now being integrated and we can track in different regions what's happening and this is in the northeast yorkshire and humber um, and in wales but this word cloud you can begin to see the sorts of search terms that are coming up frequently cough flu um, um, and you can get an idea of where the outbreaks are occurring and how severe they are but as I said earlier, that diagnostics are the cornerstone of our surveillance system. And so we um, are developing ways to link commercial tests as a first example, a demonstrator of the power of the connectivity of this system. Um, and here you can see uh, a great student of mine, Ben Miller, has developed this smartphone app which takes your camera, uh, which links to your smartphone camera. And simply when you take a test for flu, um, which is a bit like a pregnancy style test, it automatically recognises if a line is produced, if you've got influenza A proteins present in a nasal swab. That data is um, analysed on your phone and it can be stored on your phone uh, so you can keep your own records and if you so wish, sent to a healthcare system. Uh, reporting system and it can be sent directly back into that mapping system so immediately from the phone you have a real-time geographically linked test result but but as I say many of the tests the commercial tests that are out there for flu actually um, aren't good enough and so we're working with um, Molly Stevens at Imperial College who's developed some fantastic plasmonic nanosensor assays which are astonishingly sensitive down to atomolar sensitivity and together with my team we're looking at integrating some of these um, assays into a simple format and the example I show here is based on nanostars and the nucleation of silver around these gold nanostars. Now an early dissection system is only as good as the rapid follow-up response um, that can be triggered and so um, one of the, as I say, one of our key aims is to develop an end-to-end -end solution um, so that if someone is diagnosed with uh, flu, potentially in a pharmacist or at home, they can gain access to clinical care. And for this, we have to feed the results into, sorry, um, go back. Um, the results have to be fed into NHS pathways to help the patients gain access to care. Um, so this could be providing them with information about what to expect from flu um, and how long it's likely to last so they can stay at home in bed. But in certain situations, it could also be an electronic prescription that's sent to their phone, for example, for Tamiflu, that they could then take to the pharmacist and get treatment. And this may be important in um, a pandemic situation where you really want to avoid people crowding on GP surgeries. But simultaneously, the data can be fed into Public Health England um, and in order to help them protect um, the public from the spread of infections and potentially monitor the effectiveness of interventions like vaccination programmes that they might be um, rolling out. Um, and the information that can be fed back to the user can then tell them about where they can go and have vaccinations in their local area. Um, or provide them with local information of other people that are experiencing similar, similar symptoms and direct them to NHS sites for, for more information. And so we're working with leading clinicians, Anne Johnson, Rosanna Peeling, people from Public Health England, Richard Peabody and Mike Catchpole, to develop this infrastructure. And it's very much um, at an early stage now. Um, but one of the exciting developments that um, I'm pleased to tell you about is a new partnership with uh, the Africa Centre for Health and Population Studies. And it's a collaboration with Dean and Pile because we believe some of the most exciting developments will be bringing these technologies to settings, uh, where, to resource limited settings, where they don't have the um, infrastructure that we take for granted here in the UK. And that's an exciting development. Okay. So this evening I've told you um, about our research um, which aims to harness the power of nanotechnology to study the mechanism of action of some of our most powerful antibiotics and reveal the activity of new antibiotics based on surface active uh, nanomechanical um, activity. I um, highlighted um, a work, our recent work using mobile phone connected devices with OJ Bio um, to, detect, to diagnose HIV in community and primary care settings, giving results within minutes. 
and describe the very recent work uh, to create early warning sensing systems which link Twitter and search engine data to diagnostic tests using smartphone apps and plasmonic assays. But the field is moving fast and in the last month we've seen an unprecedented use of mobile technologies in the fight against Ebola. So as I say, in the last two months there have been reports of the use of web, social media, WhatsApp and text alerts to help people get the latest information in Ebola affected areas. Mobile phones and tablets are also being given to health workers to connect test results in the field to centralised labs in real time and with geographically linked information. Mobile phone locations are being used to map potential outbreaks in Ebola affected areas. And contact tracing is being used to identify those at potential risk of infection in West Africa. And here you can see uh, new partnerships are forming between private companies, governments and healthcare researchers in a bid to prevent the spread of Ebola. But the real power will be harnessing that framework and balancing public concerns over data privacy with research for global health. And what will be needed in the future are new data sharing agreements and governance frameworks to responsibly develop these technologies. And as a step in that direction, iSense will, beginning, um, a new, so will be beginning focus groups with different members of the public to understand the wider societal issues of our research. And this will be led by James Wilson, who's a philosopher at UCL and also previously worked at the Royal Society on their Open Data Initiative. And we'll also begin a crowdsourcing pilot study where volunteers linked to Flu Survey, which um, is run from the London School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, will help to evaluate the feasibility and acceptability of testing uh, from your phone putting the public very much at the centre of public health research. And we hope that together we can fight the spread of infectious diseases. So I'd like to um, say a very big thank you to a fantastic team of researchers um, from different disciplines. Here I'm showing chemists, physicists, engineers, computer scientists, epidemiologists, clinicians, um, economists all working together um, in, in, in collaborative research. I'd like to highlight though some of our, the key young people who've uh, led this work, Joseph, Moyu, Manuel and Natasha for the work on vancomycin and aritavancin, the fantastic collaboration we've got with OJ Bio and my research team at UCL who have been doing much of the work, Val, Eleanor and Claudio. Um, I'd like to highlight Bill Lampos and Jens Getty who are developing the Twitter uh, a health map and Ben Miller, who um, developed the smartphone app that can connect flu tests. Um, I'd like to thank all our partners from industry um, and other academic groups, including Molly Stevens Group, um, Public Health England, and my fantastic strategic operations team who have helped all along the way. Now, if the time still remains, my final slide will be to return to the Rosalind Franklin Award project that Carol alluded to at the beginning. So previous awardees have organised networking events, lecture tours, they've written books. But I wanted to do something different and try to again harness the power of mobile phones and web data uh, to empower women in STEM and so in, in, in science, technology, engineering and maths. And so over the next year, I'm going to be launching a national competition to develop mobile phone apps to inspire women to become leaders in, in STEM. The competition will be open to men and women, so if you've got any good ideas, please let us know. And teams will compete in four different areas, inspiring excellence, building communities, raising awareness, and the interact building interactive games. And I know my daughter will be particularly interested in this one. Um, but it's about important that we feed the pipeline and give young girls the aspirations to take on uh, careers in the future in this area. Now teams will compete for tech goodies and funding for next stage development, but the priceless prize will be the networks formed and the apps themselves, which will help to change public perceptions of women in the digital space. Um, but we hope it will be a fitting memorial to Rosalind Franklin and that it will be a lot of fun. Thank you very much.
was a really beautiful, amazing talk. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, but please, if you're going to ask a question, could you wait for a microphone so that we can all hear? If not, I'm going to start. <laughs> um, so actually, I was very interested in the vancomycin. Mm. So the two additional groups, I'm coming from a chemistry background too, seem to have such a huge difference. Do you have a theory about that? We do. I must say it's not published yet, oh, okay. although but it, hopefully it will be soon. Um, but what I can say, because it is already known, is that the two groups allow the molecules to form back-to-back -back dimers. Actually, they're ah, head-to-tail dimers. Ah, so it was Dudley Williams that elucidated this by NMR, and there's been beautiful diffraction studies. But yes, we believe that forming these complexes, these mm. dimer complexes, is crucial. And actually, it's, um, the role of the surface is also important. So I can't say too much. We're hoping it will go out in a high-profile publication okay. soon. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting yeah, it's area. Fascinating. It also helped to catalyse a small drug discovery programme that we led, which was to engineer new groups to enhance this mode of action. Mm. Very interesting. Any? I've stunned everyone. <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> Uh, Stuart Revel from um, Tech UK. I was fascinated by the different types of research and areas you're working in, but what surprised me, what I never thought I'd hear tonight, is you're using a saw filter. Um, could, you just, I, it, could you just explain <laughs> how the characteristics changed and how you discovered that? Sorry, uh, the saw filter. Did yeah, you know? I, um, well, that was a surprise to me. And I, I, my background is mobile phones and designs, and I never thought I'd saw a saw filter in this type of application. So it was fascinating. Well, you're very welcome to come and see it in action later. Dea Lathi and Hiromi Yatsuda are here today from OJ Bio with the device, so you can come and see it working. Um, and it actually builds on. Um, their innovative research, which has developed these chips, and ma they mass manufacture many millions of these um, each month, um, and they're pursuing the application of this for a range of different di uh, diagnostics. Um, so how did it come about? Well, I was always interested. The sort of golden thread in much of my research is this interest between nanomechanics and surface chemistry. And we've been working on cantilevers for a long time in a chance meeting with... Um, with uh, Dale Athey from AJ Bio led to this new collaboration, and where we could apply some of our knowledge of understanding of how antibiotics generate mechanical forces to developing sensor coatings on sores for diagnostics. And I actually think they're extremely uh, promising, and it's because of the fact that they can be mass manufactured at low cost, the readout is extremely simple, they're robust. Um, and they, they already have the connective capabilities. Um, I should say OJ Bio's parent company is Japan Radio Company, a major telecommunications uh, player. But you're welcome to come and see, talk to us later. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, the Google flu tracking at, um, project that you, you mentioned looked great when it was first published, but later it ran into trouble. Um, and I wonder if you could like say what we could learn from that. Yeah. Um, so um, that's um, that, that, that's actually a very good point. So um, recently it receives criticism because it wasn't accurately tracking um, the pattern of flu, and it overestimated. The amount of flu um, by a factor of two. And it's clear that um, for Google it was an important early demonstrator, um, but much more research is needed into training the models and improving them, and that's exactly what our team is trying to do um, with search engine data. So it, it, it all comes down to improving the models at, to um, improve the accuracy of those methods so that you can take evidence-based decisions based on uh, web data. But it's something, Bill Lampos is here and he leads this work. It's something that we're very much interested in. There's a question right in the back. Hello, it's uh, Ross Flynn. I work at Bupa. I'm just wondering whether it's 
um, may be worthwhile for you to work more closely with the mobile phone companies to make the accuracy of the readings you know, better long term. Now, are there any plans for that going yeah. forward? Well, we're w uh, working with um, Telefonica. Mike Short is here, also in the back row, um, and also have been discussing with the GSMA, the Mobile Phone Association, um, to strengthen links, as you say, for those very reasons with providers. Hi, um, I was interested to hear about the mobile phone app and the flu diagnosis. Um, am I correct in assuming that it requires a, a diagnostic sort of test? The per pe person needs to have that, test themselves, and then input the result into the mobile phone app? Um, the way the app works, as you rightly say, it's with commercial tests. Um, and essentially the person has to take a nasal swab to insert the sample on um, the chip and then within a few minutes a line appears and typically anyone who's taken a pregnancy test will know that interpreting that line can be subjective and um, using the mobile phone app takes the, the, the difficulty of that decision out because we simply look at the colour change and are able to um, not just read if it's there yes or no but quantify how much is there. So is the test at the moment available? Those are commercial tests, yes, that are available, um, although aren't widely used. And one of the reasons is um, that they aren't very sensitive. Um, so the FDA, um, the Food and Drug Administration, has recently reviewed flu tests um, and is recategorizing them according to their sensitivity. And that's one of the motivations behind our research, which is actually to build tests that can pick up flu uh, proteins at very high, with very high sensitivity. But as the early demonstrator, while that research is progressing, we, we've worked with these commercial tests. Do, do, you, do you have any plans to maybe make these available for GP practices to, as a way of reporting flu? Because it's a very moment, good question. Yeah. So um, we've been in discussion with Simon de Lusignan, who's a GP um, in um, Surrey, in Guildford, um, about creating a pilot um, test of these sorts of tests, and not just the lateral flow type tests, but also molecular tests for flu testing in doctor's surgeries. Um, and, but it's clear that the time, the speed of these tests is crucial. And all our discussions with end users, and we've talked to GPs and also patient groups, it's time is a crucial factor. A GP's appointment is 10 minutes, so you really have to have a test that gives a result very quickly, or you triage people um, in the waiting room um, in order to get that diagnosis working well. Rachel, I think like many, I, I'm sitting here stunned by the, by the, just the breadth and depth of what I've just, but just witnessed. Um, and it's the way that so much has been integrated into something so, so, so practical, but obviously so scientifically significant. Uh, I'm probably going to ask you, Rachel, the, the, one of the really difficult questions, because it's perhaps not entirely scientific, but I, I sense we've glimpsed something here of the networked world that we read so much about, and, and my business is risk. And I sense at, at heart this is a, could make a truly significant difference to reducing the risk of morbidity, or dare I say mortality within populations. And I just want to get your sense of the significance of where this could take the health of populations, whether it's here in the UK or, or in Africa, in the next couple of decades, that this sort of integration of information in, into, into medicine, into services. It, it's a truly remarkable vision. Well, we do, I mean, um, I should say that, that people around the world are working in this area. Um, we we um, do believe it would be transformational. And um, we can see it's not, it is a revolution in some way, but it's also an evolution of technology. So already mobile uh, phone connected diagnostics are used from people who have diabetes, where they test at home. 
my mum and dad, who are in the front of the audience here, recently had wearable sensors for cardiovascular diseases, you know, 24 hour ECGs, and blood coagulation tests that are used in the home. These tests are out there now. And so at one end of the spectrum are people with chronic diseases, at the other end of the spectrum, are the health conscious, the fit. And many of my researchers over here use Fitbit and many other apps to track their health. So this is, these technologies are emerging, they're coming through. What we have to do is create, the, the real big challenges are bringing them together and creating the governance um, and, and data sharing framework that can integrate this data. And that's why working with um, the NHS and Public Health England and bringing together companies like Microsoft, like Telefonica, like OJ Bio is, is, is crucial to catalyzing these developments. But, you know, it's, it's happening not just here, it's happening across the world. And um, this, th these technologies will, will become mainstream, I'm pretty sure, in the next decade. Question at the front. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Malcolm Grant, Chairman of NHS England, and just picking up on that last question. Um, first of all, really astonishing um, the amount of interaction and interdisciplinarity that's gone into this. I thought that that was um, remarkably impressive. But I've just come from a meeting of our board where we've spent a lot of time uh, thinking through the potentially disruptive impact of new technologies on the way in which we deliver care in this country. and. Um, Everything that you've said tonight, Rachel, uh, suggests to me that although everything that you're doing is, is, is immensely sophisticated, it's also the beginning uh, of a much bigger, and I would use the word revolution, in the way in which we uh, not only advance diagnostics, prediction, and the delivery of care, uh, but, but also, I think, transform the way in which general practice uh, is conducted. So I'm really keen to uh, explore with you how you see this emerging and developing, what further technologies can be introduced through um, the mobile phone, uh, and what impact you can see them having, not just in 20 years' time, but actually in the next five years. I had a presentation last night from an entrepreneur to the board who said we're, we're pro cor currently using about 3% of the capacity of a mobile phone compared to in five years' time. One of the things we have to worry about with the NHS is how do we use this so as to enhance the quality of care to patients and reduce the cost uh, mm. to the NHS. And that has to be a major driver to make our whole system much more efficient as a consequence of um, using technology, much of which is going to be developed in this country. Mm. Um, I absolutely agree. The cost effectiveness is, um, is, is crucial here to show the benefits of these uh, technologies. But we can see impact across a range of disease areas from cardiovascular disease to, um, to using these sort of, te sort of technologies for mental illness, for infectious diseases. Um, there are now huge advances in the development of apps and wearable sensors for all sorts of different applications. But the cost effectiveness is important. And I think what has to happen is we have to begin these sorts of pilot, create test beds within the NHS to evaluate these technologies yeah. and actually study um, the cost effectiveness of the outcomes that these technologies can bring. And having a husband who's a health economist and regularly at NICE, I know that you know, this will be crucial um, to getting these technologies adopted by the NHS. And we're keen to work with early adopters to show the power of these methods. Okay, final question at the back. Actually, actually it's, it's not a question really, it, okay. it's a comment. So I mentioned I'm from Tech UK um, earlier, which is actually the lar largest technology trade body. Uh, in the UK. Um, I'm sat here completely inspired and I'd just like to compliment you for the work that you've been doing. It's absolutely brilliant. But I'm also sat here completely frustrated as well. Um, and I'd like to offer and extend some help from Tech UK because many of the technologies that we're talking about, we're scratching the surface in terms of connecting up NHS, whether it's social care, health care. And it's something I've been trying to pioneer on different activities and we've got so much potential with these types of technologies and I'd just like to extend 
really an invitation to anybody that wants to help us. We work with all the leading companies in the UK, so we, we need to make this happen, and uh, hopefully we can do it. We're you. delighted to follow up with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think you'll agree um, this was an outstanding lecture, fantastic idea, and this was one of the reasons why Rachel really stood out as the Rosalind Frank Franklin lecturer this year. So I'd like to hand to her um, a special medal <laughs> in this you box. So you much. can open it. Um, it's really, well, maybe it's more complicated. <laughs> it's a series of boxes <laughs> to open. This is a challenge. <laughs> yeah. oh. There we go. It's very beautiful. <laughs> and thank, you. Well. Thank, you thank you so much. Thank you so much.